Well, I am Pastor Ben, and I am so excited to continue our sermon series this morning called Silver Linings. And the reason I'm excited to continue our sermon series is because I believe this sermon series has the power to bring hope into your life. Hope into an incredibly dark time for each and every one of us. And, and the reason I, I know it's going to do that is because it has been specifically designed with you in mind for this moment and, and this crisis. And I say it's going to bring hope, not because I believe in cliches like behind every dark cloud there is a silver lining, but as a, a follower of Christ, I do believe in God's promises. And there's been one specific promise that, that we have been holding on to throughout this sermon series. It comes to us in the book of Romans. And we are told that God will work all things out for good for those who love him and who are called by his purpose. And so we've been clinging on to that promise and we've actually been testing that promise. And how we've been doing that is we've actually looked into the Old Testament because this is what we know. The past is a, a powerful predictor of the future, especially when it comes to God, because God does not change, which means what he has done in the past, he can do in the future. What he has done in the past, he will do in the future. And so we've been looking into the past. We've been looking into the Old Testament and looking at real historical people who had real experiences with God and went through very, very difficult and dark times, but yet God brought good into their life. And so today we're actually stepping into part five. And if you have missed out, maybe you missed part two or three or four, or maybe this is your first time, don't worry. You can go to our website, nllutheran.com, and all the sermons are, are catalog cataloged there. And so you can catch up, get connected, and, and hear every message of hope and every message of truth for your difficult time, for your dark time right now. But I'm going to give you a little refresher. If this is your first time, this will help a lot. If you've been attending faithfully through the entire sermon series, it will still help because we quickly forget, don't we? So let's go back. If we remember the, the first week, we ran into a guy named Joseph. And Joseph had some trouble in his life. His brothers actually betrayed him and sold him into slavery, which means in that moment, he lost his family and he lost his freedom. In week two, we talked about a guy named Hosea who had recently married this woman who was unfaithful to him time and time again. And so he lost trust in her and he, he fought that battle and he fought that loss all throughout his life as God taught him and worked through that with him. The third week, we talked about a guy named Elijah. And this guy was an incredible hero of the faith. You've probably heard of him already. An amazing, an amazing, an amazing man. But despite all of those accolades, he suffered from depression because he lost hope that tomorrow was going to be better than the day before. And if you feel that way for long enough, not only do you suffer from depression, but you become suicidal. And that's what happened. That's what happened to Elijah. He became suicidal because of this loss of hope in his life. Now, last week, in, in week four, it was Mother's Day, and we talked about an amazing lady. Her name was Ruth, and she experienced a lot of loss as well. She lost her father-in-law, she lost her brothers-in-law, and she lost her very own spouse. And so as we look through these, these four characters, these historical characters, we see a central theme working through their lives. And it's that theme of loss. And we can understand that right now. In fact, as we hear these stories, we can empathize with these characters. We can understand them because their stories sound a lot like our stories right now. Because all of us are experiencing a lot of loss. It might be the loss of a job that you're suffering through right now or the loss of an income right now. It might be that your retirement account that you thought was more secure than it was has been depleted because all the stocks are down. It might be the loss of your health right now. It might be the loss of a loved one. Or maybe it's just simply the loss of freedom. Being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. All those things are difficult. And all those things bring losses into our life, just like these characters experienced in their life. But this is what we know. We know God can do amazing things no matter what horrible things happen to us. And he can bring light and hope into every situation. So today we're going to step into part five and we're going to engage with a guy named Gideon. And we're going to see this man experience loss, but also God brings hope into his conversation and sets him on a great path. And this is what we read. 
So Gideon and the hundred who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. So right away, we run into our main character. His name is, is Gideon. And to understand Gideon, you have to understand what's happening a- around Gideon. Because none of us are born into a vacuum, right? The history that we're living in, the culture that we're living in, it, it all influences us in a heavy-handed way. And so what Gideon was, was living within is a group of people, the Israelites, who were having a lot of ups and downs. Once Joshua, their great leader, died, they would follow God for a little bit, and then they would unfollow God, right? They would reject God. And they had these ups and downs associated with that. When they followed God, things would go pretty well. Their life would go pretty well, and, and they would do amazing things. But when they would reject God, tragedy would strike. Now, of course, this is how our lives work too, isn't it? When we follow in God's healthy patterns for our life, we, we do better in life, and, and, and life just seems to function a little bit better. But when we want to do it our own way, we reject God's way, it typically ends up in tragedy. And that's what's happening for the Israelite people. They follow God, things go well. They reject God, things go poorly. And, and right now, in this moment, what's happening is they have completely rejected God. They started following a, a false God. And because of that, for seven years, they have been driven out of their land. They're living in caves, just hiding, just trying to survive. That's what Gideon is living within. That's the reality. In fact, it was so bad that every time they tried to return to normal, every time they would go out and and plant their fields or, or start buying some cattle and just trying to normalize life, once again, the Midianites, this, this nation that was ruling over them, would wipe out their crops, wipe out their cattle, or steal it all and drive them back into the caves. That's the life they were living in, hiding away, stuck in these caves with no hope on the horizon. And so because of that, God used this dark time to change their hearts. Oftentimes in dark times, we turn to God because we realize so quickly that we've relied on the wrong things. And that's what these people did. They called out to God and God answered. And he sent a messenger to Gideon. And when the messenger shows up, we don't find a hero in the story. We find somebody who's hopeless, very much worthless, a classic underachiever. In fact, when the messenger shows up, we find Gideon making bread inside a a wine press, meaning he's hiding. All he's trying to do is feed himself, but he's too scared to be out in public because he's scared he's going to have his bread stolen or he's going to be killed. And so he's, he's just in this moment, just trying to survive, right? Not trying to thrive, not even thinking about thriving, just trying to survive from day to day to day. And the messenger shows up and he says this to Gideon. He said, Gideon, God is with you. Which of course, Gideon, just like probably many of us in dark times, scoffed at it, right? God is with me, God is for me. Look around, look at the reality we're living in. I'm stuck in this cave. I can't go anywhere. If I go outside, I try to plant my field. It's going to get destroyed. How is God for me? You see, oftentimes we buy into this lie as believers that if we do things the way God wants us to do them, that he's just going to bless every area of our life, that we'll never experience loss. How quickly we forget that our faith is founded on loss. The fact that Jesus, the perfect one, went to the cross and gave up his life, experienced the ultimate loss so that we could have our sins forgiven. That's the promise that we have. That's the promise that we hold on to, that Jesus has given up his life. He has experienced the ultimate loss. So why would we think that we'd be any different? Why would we expect God not to use the losses in our life to bring about something good? So Gideon, he scoffs at the messenger, And the messenger gets kind of irritated and says to Gideon, look, what have you done? Right, you're going to point your finger at God and say, God, you haven't done anything, but Gideon, what have you done? Now, of course, this instantly humbles Gideon because the truth is he hadn't done anything. He hadn't gotten an army together. He hadn't fought back. He hadn't done anything. He's hiding in a wine press just trying to make bread. This is who Gideon is. But the messenger says, Gideon, I'm going to use you in a powerful way. God is going to use you in a powerful way. Of course, Gideon's thinking, there's no way you're going to use me. I am nothing, which is actually the beauty of the story. 
which is actually the beauty of our lives, isn't it? We truly are nothing, but it's God's power working through us that does something and really makes an amazing impact in the world. So, of course, Gideon, he's not convinced. So God steps up to convince him. And he says, let me take that bread, right? The messenger says, come, let me take that bread, grab me some meat, and then take the broth from the meat and pour it over the bread and the meat. So they're, they're doused, right? They are wet. And then something amazing happens, which is actually a foreshadowing of something that happens in Elijah's life later on, which if you were here two weeks ago, you heard the story. But this is what happens. They douse the bread and they douse the meat and then God shows up and shows off and he burns up everything. The bread is gone, the meat is gone, all the liquid on top, it, it's gone. God shows that he has power to do whatever he wants to do through whomever he wants to do it. And so Gideon has this kind of restoration. So in the middle of the night, he sneaks out and he destroys the altar of Baal, which once again, that has some correlation between Elijah's story as well, because later on, the Israelites would follow this false god again. So anyways, he wipes out the altar and then he begins to build this army. And he builds an army of 32,000 people, which would be like Rock Falls, Sterling, and Morrison joining forces to make one big Mustang, rocket, warrior army, right? That's the idea. So now he has this, this big army that he can kind of trust in. He's got enough numbers that maybe if they fought the Midianites, maybe, just maybe, just maybe they could do something. But he's still not quite convinced, right? He, he's still not there. And so he needs more. He sets up this test. Hey, God, this is what I'm going to do in the morning when the dew comes. I'm going to put a cloak out there. I'm going to put a fleece out there. And if the ground is dry and the fleece is wet, I know you are with me, right? I, I know you're telling me the truth. I know your promises are real. So he does it and God answers, right? That's exactly what happens. The ground is dry. The fleece is wet. Gideon's not fully convinced. So he goes back and says, look, now we need to reverse this. Let the ground be wet and let the fleece be dry. And if you can do that, then I will trust you. And of course, that's exactly what happens. But then from that moment, God says, I want you to trust me. I want you to take that massive army that you've created, 32,000 men, and I actually want you to turn it into an army of 300 men. Now, of course, this is crazy, right? To go to war with a group of people that has wiped you out time and time and time and time again with 300 people, that's impossible. And that's what Gideon is feeling. Despite all these signs and all these wonders and all these promises, he's not certain what's going to happen. So God once again says, this is what I want you to do, Gideon. Sneak down into the enemy camp and just hang out there. Just hang out. Don't let them see you. Just, just sit and listen to what they're saying. And so that's what Gideon does. He sneaks down and he just listens. And you know what the enemy is concerned about? You know what they're talking about? They're talking about the power of God and they're talking about Gideon. And this is enough for Gideon, right? God has shown up and shown off time and time and time and time again. And so he has enough trust. He has enough faith. And this is where we pick up our story. This is what's happening. And this is what we read. When they had just set the watch and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. So as we continue our story, we actually, we step into the strategy of what Gideon is doing, what God is telling him to do. First of all, we see that they have just switched the watch, which means it's the middle of the night, it, it's pitch black, and then all of the tired soldiers have gone to bed, and all the new soldiers had come out to protect their encampment. So right away, there's, there's so many things that are happening that seem strategically unwise, right? It just seems unwise. First of all, there's fresh soldiers out front, and then their plan of attack is to take 300 men and make a bunch of noise and, and show their location, right? I'm going to blow a trumpet and I'm going to hold a torch so you know exactly where I am and then you'll come and kill us all, right? It's only 300 men. So this strategy seems unwise. Now, I'm not a military trained person, but if I had 300 people and I was battling a full army, I would sneak in in the dark not make a noise and take out as many as I possibly could and maybe turn the tide a little bit. That, that would be my, my plan of attack. Gideon actually is told and does the exact opposite. Here's the result. 
So the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars, holding in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. So once again, we see this plan unfolding and we see something else that's troublesome about this plan. Notice what's in their hands, right? In one hand, they have a trumpet and in the other hand, they have a torch. Now, if your hands are full of a trumpet and a torch, guess what you cannot grab? The weapon of the day, the sword, right? What are you going to do with a trumpet? What are you going to do with a torch? This is not going to help you win a war. This is not going to help you win a battle. But the men, they trusted God, and they knew God would provide, and so this is what they yell. And they cried, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. In other words, what these men knew is that God was for them. God was with them. They didn't need a sword because God was their sword. And God was using Gideon as the sword. So let's see what works. Let's see what happens. After they yell this, this is what what transpires. Every man stood in his place all around the camp. And all the men in the camp ran. They cried out and fled. So they stand in a big circle around the entire camp. 300 people, not 32,000 people, they stand in a circle and they yell this out. And they yell, look, there's a sword for God, there's a sword for Gideon. And this, of course, draws the attention of the enemy army. Right now they're on a high alert, they have their swords, they're ready to battle. And they're probably expecting a lot more men because who would go against them besides a large army or multiple armies joining together to defeat them, right? This is that kind of power we're talking about. So they just yell, a sword for God and a sword for Gideon, and it throws off the other army. This is what transpires. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow and against all of the army. So they put their game plan into play. They scream, draws their attention. All these guys pull their swords, and then they break the jars, which were covering the torches, and they blow their trumpets. So now this army is disoriented, right? It's the middle of the night. It's pitch black and all of a sudden there's light. And if you've ever been outside and looked into a light bulb when it's dark, what happens? You cannot see. And if you cannot see and you cannot hear and you're on high alert and you have your sword and you see the flashing of steel, what are you going to do? You're going to attack everything around you. In fact, when I watch military movies, I always wonder why this doesn't happen more often. Why people who are on high alert don't grab their guns and accidentally shoot all of their people because they're scared. But that's what happens. These guys are are terrified because they don't know what's going on. They're disoriented and they start killing everything they see. And so what happens? They wipe themselves out. And once the few that are left realize what's going on, this is what they do. And the army fled as far as Bashida towards Zerah as far as the border of Abel, Maloah, by Tabith. So this army, once they realize they're getting wiped out by their own sword, they take off, right? Now they are far fewer in number. They are not organized, and off they go. And this is what Gideon does. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after the Midianites. So this is what they do. Now Gideon gets his full squad, his full team, and they chase them down and they wipe them out. And as a result of Gideon being faithful to God, Israel experiences 40 years of peace. And this great leader, this great warrior, he has a lot of time on his hands. And guess what happens? It says in scripture that he had 71 kids because that's how peaceful life was for the nation of Israel. They were not scared at all. And so 71 kids was an amazing blessing to Gideon. Now, I will be completely honest. If I had 71 kids, I don't think that sounds like a blessing. But for Gideon, as we read in scripture, it was an amazing blessing for Gideon as God allowed him to experience peace and restoration and hope out of this horrible time of darkness. So as we look at Gideon's story, And as we contemplate our our own story, we've been asking this question all throughout this sermon series. The question is this, what will we find on the other side? 
What will we find on the other side of this dark reality that we are living in? And if, if the past predicts the future, which it does, especially with God, if we look at, at Gideon's life, this is what we see. We see potential. Because in Gideon's life, this is, this is what we, we find hiding in a wine press, this man hiding in a wine press. Somebody was hopeless, worthless, useless. A classic underachiever that never expected anything from his life. But then God shows up. But then God, that's the whole story of our faith. But then God, then God died on the cross. Then God does these things for us. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. God shows up in Gideon's life and works through Gideon and makes an amazing impact. And that's where we run into another truth in Scripture that I think is so important. You see, we read in Scripture that God wishes that all people would be saved. In other words, that he, he wishes that he has a transformative relationship with everyone on the planet. He wants everyone to be his children, which means they'll have transformation in the eternal, right? They will all go to be in heaven if they don't reject God. But of course, far too many people reject God and don't want a relationship with him. And of course, he's not going to force them into that relationship. But there's a secondary beautiful truth about God being in relationship with us. Not only do we experience transformation in the future, but we experience transformation in the present. See, he doesn't want to just leave us the way we are, hopeless and worthless and useless and trying to work on our own power. He wants to use us. And that means that every one of us has unlimited potential. Because as believers, we are not empowered by ourselves. We are empowered by the work of God, by allowing God to work through us and bring hope and his message and love into the world. So what will we find on the other side of this darkness? I believe one of the answers to many answers that we've, we've learned along the series is potential. Because God wants to work through your life. It doesn't matter what skills you have. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much charisma you have. It's allowing God to work through you, to bring his potential out in your life so you can bring his story and his hope and his love to the world. Amen. At this time, please join me as we sing our hymn of the day.